Welcome to Coffee, Culture, and the Capital with Sophia and Greg. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. We have some fun things we're going to talk to you all about today. We have an update about DuPont Clinic, the all-trimester abortion clinic. We talked to you all about it last week about the event, and we have an update to give today. It's a good it's a good report. A good report, yes. As well as we're going to talk a little bit more about Sonia Shaw, the Chino Valley Unified School District Board President. She's turned into a national hero. Yes, as well as we're going to give some more updates about our event that is now, it's officially this month, so two weeks away. About two, two, two and a half weeks, three weeks away. <laughs> so make sure to start making plans to get to Sacramento, but we'll dive into that at the end and give you all information. But first, DuPont Clinic. You had a fabulous time, I heard. Yes. I watched it online, but you went down to Beverly Hills, which yes. is usually a fancy place that uh, the world goes. Uh, mm-hmm. has a great reputation, but they have had something terrible that was planned. Uh, for their, that area. So why don't you tell us all about it? Yeah, well, mentioning Beverly Hills, I grew up in Southern California, and so my friends and I would go to LA for the day and things like that. And I never thought I'd be going to Beverly Hills, not just for a fun brunch or to go get coffee with friends. Yeah. I never thought I'd go out there to protest on the streets on the steps of what was set to be an all-trimester abortion clinic. Now, all-trimester abortion. I don't think people usually know what that means, so why don't you explain? Yeah, so obviously abortion is one of the most controversial issues of our time. Oh. And when you think of abortion, there's some people that say, no, no, I'm pro-choice or I'm pro-life. But most people can get together Um, and state that they are against third trimester abortion. And so for those of you that are listening or watching or aren't familiar with third trimester abortion, that this clinic is willing to kill children, kill babies in the womb up to 31 weeks and six days. So at 31 weeks and six days, a woman is over seven and a half months pregnant. A baby is viable outside of the womb by 22 weeks. So... Mm -hmm. This baby now that they're willing to kill has been viable for nine weeks outside of the womb. So a lot of times when a baby is born at 22 weeks, obviously, like, you don't want a baby to be born at 22 weeks. It'd be great to go full term. But a baby can survive outside of the womb at 22 weeks with medical help. And normally it'd be safer for the child to be in the womb. But if this clinic were to open in California, it would actually be safer for the child to already be born if the mother was abor- uh, abortion-minded and was thinking about killing the baby, because they're not going to kill the baby once it's born. That's right. Now, California has done late-term abortions before, mm-hmm. but previously, uh, any baby that um, was viable, there was supposed to be, you could only abort a child, kill a child in the womb, if it was viable for a couple reasons. There had to be a, th- a threat to the health and safety of the mother. Mm-hmm. You know, that could be broadly interpreted as mental health. But uh, since uh, California passed Prop 1, uh, it guaranteed uh, protecting abortion through all three trimesters. And so that viability standard no longer uh, mattered. So this this was going to be the first they call at-will late-term abortion. means you could take kill your baby past viability for any reason. They just wouldn't even ask the reason. Mm -hmm. And to touch on what you were saying, once the baby, when the baby is viable, so 22 weeks, you never have to have an abortion to save the life of a mother after 22 weeks. Well, in general, but just for the broader understanding, after 22 weeks, because the way a third trimester abortion looks, it's a three-day process. So it first starts with injecting um, potassium chloride through a woman's abdomen and to the baby's heart to end the life of the baby. And mind you, this is the same drug administered to criminals on the death penalty. But apparently it's safe to put through a woman's abdomen into a baby's heart. Once the baby has been killed from that, they then administer labor-inducing medication to the mother to then have her give birth to her dead third trimester baby. And it's about a three-day process and there can be lots of complications. So either way, the mother is still giving birth, but now a three-day process to a dead baby. So if the mother's life is in danger, 
Why would you not just induce labor and have her give birth to her alive child that can survive and is viable outside of the womb? Yeah, makes no sense. Makes so, no sense at all. That's the clinic that was going to open up in Beverly Hills. They announced it last October, and we posted something about it right away. And survivors of the abortion holocaust, another pro-life group, they've been posting a lot about it. And they decided to have a summer of activism where they were DuPont Clinic was their main focus. They were outside of it for about two weeks, praying, passing out flyers, going to people around Beverly Hills. You know, they're just it's a block or two off a of Rodeo Drive. So they're going down there to all the stores, telling everyone about it. And one of their big final events was this prayer and worship protest that we told you all about last week. And I went to this Saturday and we live streamed the whole event on our Facebook page. So you guys can also check it out there. But we all went to prayer to pray, worship, and protest the opening of this clinic. And we started off, there was, I would say there's probably 800, 900 people there. And we did a couple worship songs. And then the outreach director at Survivors of the Abortion Holocaust, Tim Clement, he got on stage and he read an email that they received the night before the event. And he informed everyone that the deputy city manager of Beverly Hills indicated that the building owner rescinded a DuPont Clinic lease. So we received the news that DuPont Clinic will not be opening up. And immediately it was just like tears of joy, people just praising and worshiping. And it turned from a protest to a prayer and worship um, celebration. celebration. Yeah. And so I was able to speak at that and I'll show you guys the clip. But what I think was really cool is none of the spe even though survivors found out the night before, none of the speakers even knew about this news. So Pastor John Randall from Calvary South OC, he was there. Um, AJ Hurley, which I believe he knew because he was helping put on the event with survivors. Seth Gruber from the White Rose Resistance. And then there was a couple other speakers. No one knew that the clinic was opening. So, you know, you go in, you're, okay, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about how this clinic needs to be shut down and all these things. You've had your speech all yes, ready. Yes, all ready to go. And then they're like, surprise, like, it's not opening, which is great news. Like, I would take that and have nothing to say, like, all day long. But... I think all the speakers then, it was everything people had to say was really just from the heart then. Because mm. they didn't come in preparing to give a celebration yeah. about the place closing. So I'll show you all um, what I had to say. But again, you can check out all the speakers and the whole rally on our Facebook. Hello, everyone. I'm Sophia Laurie, and I'm the host of This is a Woman podcast and the outreach coordinator at California Family Council, where we fight day in and day out to advance God's design for life family and liberty across California's church, capital, and culture. And today, we stand on the steps of what was set to be an all-trimester murder mill. But Christians, when we show up, when the capital C church shows up, Satan's abortion clinic is closed. Christians, we won today, but the battle for life is not over. Here in California, our governor and our legislators have done all they can to push, promote, and legalize the dismemberment of innocent children in the womb. Every day in California, we must fight for life until abortion is unthinkable and unimaginable. We must make sure our legislators know that no matter what they think, Californians are pro-life. We cannot change the hearts and minds of our legislators, but Jesus Christ can. So today, let's pray for them. Lord Jesus, Father God, we just, we thank you for the win and we celebrate what has happened here today. But we pray for Governor Gavin Newsom. We pray for Senator Scott Weiner and the legislators in California that are pushing evil, Lord, that think it's okay to dismember children, Lord. We pray that you change their minds, you change their hearts, and they see that they are willing to kill innocent children, Lord. We pray that you let them see that these children, they are made perfectly in your image. They are knitted together, fearfully and wonderfully made in their mother's womb, Lord. Lord, today we pray right now that Governor Gavin Newsom feels on his heart and sees on his mind that what he is doing in California is evil and wrong, Lord. 
Lord, we pray and we know we will win this battle. Amen. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. It ended up being, like I said, a great event, a great time to celebrate. But as I mentioned, like on when I was speaking, the fight for life is nowhere near over in California. So continue to follow along with us. We'll, we have our Merch for Life we host. We have our date set for next year. We'll be announcing that soon. And just follow along for updates about legislation that's attacking life. Great. Um, well, want to shift topics uh, a little bit. As you know, if you've been watching our podcast, that uh, we've been advocating for parental rights here in California. And one of the concerning things that are happening in school districts that uh, that kids who are confused about their gender and then they ask their teachers and uh, the school to change their name, to change their pronouns, to start using bathrooms of the opposite sex, being on sport teams of the opposite sex, and then the school district keeps that all secret from the parents no matter what age the kid is. And that is uh, the... California uh, Department of Education is encouraging that secrecy policy, saying kids have privacy rights from their parents. Uh, they're telling school boards that's what the law requires, but the law does not require that. There's no specific law that says anything about kids, especially as young as four, five, six, having privacy rights from their own parents. And that this kind of thing, changing your gender, parents should be involved. They should be notified. So. We tried to introduce a bill this year with the bill, uh, Assemblyman uh, Asaley, uh, 1314. Uh, that bill did not even get a hearing. It was just a notification bill uh, asking schools to notify parents if a kid is asking to identify as a different gender. But since we didn't give up, we ended up putting together something called the Coalition for Parental Rights, which was a bunch of Nonprofit uh, organizations here in California fighting for parental rights, and we pulled together our resources and we put together a website and put together a policy that local school districts could implement because it's not illegal for a local school district with their authority to uh, designate a, a policy regarding uh, this type of thing. And so uh, Chino Valley, uh, down in Southern California, implemented the policy to great fanfare <laughs> and national news. Uh, and Sonia Shaw, uh, the president of that school district, uh, has kind of become a hero of sorts mm -hmm. because the superintendent of schools, Tony Thurman, actually came down during the school board meeting and you know said, you're breaking the law, <laughs> this is terrible. Tried to have a debate with her, she had to shut him down and was kind of a, you know, quite a hubbub of, of news media coverage around that incident. But uh, Sonia Shaw has been doing some great interviews. And so we're going to show you uh, an interview she did for Fox News, ex just explaining why uh, she was motivated to pass this particular policy in her district. Simple notification policy um, would end up going viral and all over the nation. Um, I had people reach out to me from almost every state in, in the USA just giving me support, encouragement, wanting to even um, purchase security items for my home. Um, but on the opposite end, you know, I got some heat too. Um, there's a lot of name calling, nasty things I would never wish upon anybody. Um, and then of course the death threats on me and my family and my animals. Um, but I, I will say this, the support has been overwhelming and beautiful and encouraging because it definitely outweighs um, the ugliness but with the ugliness also proves who's after the children because to inform the parent and then to go that wild should prove that those are the same people that want control of the kids. It was, was a policy to inform the parents. It's so weird we're even in this place. It's like, where is the morality and the moral values in our country that these people are going this wild? It's not like anybody's stopping anybody from doing anything in their lifestyle. All we're saying is a parent needs to be notified because we have incidents um, that, the, you know, and I love teachers. I have a lot of teacher friends, but we have incidents where teachers have inappropriate conversations. Um, there is a lot of sexual abuse increasing with teachers recently. I mean, we see it all over the place. We have our own department of ed that instead of their focus on, you know, making sure our kids are raising their test scores, especially after the shutdown, their passion is on 
social justice and sexualization of children. And it's just that much more apparent when they come and blackmail and try to sponsor bills to shut us up that we're in a dangerous place as a society. But I think it also is great that just us normal day-to-day -day folks that had no political ambitions are finally realizing the dangers that a lot of these people in these political positions are imposing on our children. And I think that's what's wonderful is it no longer becomes a political thing. It becomes a moral thing. And no matter what political party you, um, you know, associate with, I think we can all agree that our children are number one and they're precious and we need to join together no matter what we um, believe otherwise to protect our children. I will say this, the ones that are local, our, our police department is on it and I appreciate them tremendously. We have extra um, drive-bys on my house from them and our district security is also driving by our home multiple times throughout the day to make sure my family stays safe. It's no, it's no secret that I am a Christ follower and I love Jesus. I don't push that in the schools. I do have moral values that tie into, I would say, you know, being a Christ follower. But here's, here's what I say. Local churches do play a part because this isn't a political thing. This is a moral thing. And if you, if you are a believer, you know, this is a spiritual battle. You know that when people are saying they're going to kill you and they're after the kids that is an evil demonic spiritual battle so here's what i do say local churches can and do play a part am i appreciative that our local one of our local church stepped up and are praying for me and offering support and you know any kind of resources that my family need absolutely that's what happens when you unite together right? it, we are human we don't know how you know there's no playbook on this um but i could say the prayer, the support are absolutely needed in this. That was a great interview. And, and she said, you know, uh, parents like herself are standing up. I mean, with no political ambitions. I mean, she was, she was a soccer mom, right? A fitness trainer that uh, got frustrated with uh, during the COVID shutdowns and got involved with trying to advocate for her kids and, and then uh, decided to run for school board, and she won <laughs> to the uh, Teachers Association and a lot of other activists' chagrin. Uh, but now she's actually, you know, making changes that parents actually want. They're protecting parental rights. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need. We need to get out of office these career politicians where their whole life is to be a politician, and they're getting tons of money from Planned Parenthood and all these organizations. Yeah. We need to have at least start with our school boards, they need to be parents that want what's best for what's the children That's right. or adults that want what's best for the children, not adults that are just trying to start the school board to then maybe go to their city council to then go to California Capitol. That like, we don't need people that are in it just for all the money from all these organizations. We need people that are in it for what's right for the children. And Sonia is the perfect example of that. Yeah, and I, what I hope, we hope happens is that more people do what she did Mm -hmm. uh, here in California, we have so many local school districts. There are elementary school districts. There are you know high school districts. Mm -hmm. There are hundreds and hundreds of small little local governments who have authority, and they have authority over their own policies. Mm -hmm. the The state, you know, has not usurped the, all their policies. Local government has uh, the ability to push back. Uh, and to decide to decide for themselves how they're going to implement policy. And so it's so great to see this particular school district doing that. But we want other school districts to do the same. So in that vein, we uh, recently uh, had a informational meeting uh, for other school district uh, board members uh, who would, might be interested in doing the same thing in your district, their district. And surprise, surprise, we were overwhelmed with the response. You know, we had uh, about uh, over 100 people sign up, um, probably 80 people got on, and, you know, we talked for a little over an hour, and, you know, I think a lot of people are very interested in this particular topic. They don't, they really want their school districts to be working with parents, not against them. And that's something the state uh, continues to imply that parents are the problem. Right. I mean, we want your involvement, but you better be on board with it. What everything, everything we're we're about on gender, and so many parents do not want their kids to think that they could pick their gender, 
you know, and, and the, all the gender changing happening behind their back. And so finally, parents are pushing back, and this is just the beginning. Hopefully, it will spread throughout mm -hmm. the country. Yeah, and Sonia made a great point when she was talking about this policy. I forget if it was on the interview we just showed or another one, but she was saying this policy, it's not stopping you from doing anything with your life. It's not stopping you. Like, if you and your parents want you to go through this gender transition and all that, it's not stopping that from happening. All this policy is doing is saying, Parents need to be aware. Yeah, it is the very basic. Ba it's just so basic. Like in, uh, I, I was hearing an interview, Chloe Cole, she's a detransitioner, and I was listening to an interview she was doing today. And, you know, she was, she was talking about how here in California, you can't go into a tanning bed, uh, mm -hmm. even, if with, even without parental permission. You can't, you, you can't get aspirin at school. You know, you can't get a tattoo without parental consent. All There's all kinds of things that you want parental involvement with. Mm -hmm. And changing your gender is a big deal. It You know, and socially tra transing, transitioning leads to medical transitioning. And so, you know, parents need to be intimately involved with all these decisions little kids are making. And schools should be encouraging that relationship. Mm -hmm. A 12-year-old just shouldn't have the power to sterilize and mutilate their bodies because they're not old enough to oh, yeah. know. And I mean, that goes back to how you said there is parents have the right to give permission for certain things. And you have to have either parent permission or you have to wait till you're 18 to get a tattoo and all these different things. And it even comes down to like, you can't drink until you're 21. You can't even vote until you're 18. want you to. Exactly. <laughs> and I mean, your brain's not fully developed until you're 25. So your brain's not fully developed, but... And how old do you know? Yeah, my, my, I'm two years out from my brain being fully developed. But, but the, your brain's not fully developed to your 25, but at 12 years old, you should be able to cut off healthy body parts? I don't know. Yeah, make, that makes sense. But also back to what Sonia was saying, she talked about there's been some threats against her. We showed a clip of her last week talking about death threats against her. And we just received news that the um, person who was the suspect about threatening violence on Sonia was arrested. And she was a 52-year-old woman living up in Berkeley. So mind you, if you're not like super familiar where Cheeto is in Berkeley, like Berkeley's up here in Northern California. And Cheeto is down in Southern California. And she was, I don't know what this lady was thinking, but... She's been arrested. There was another threat against Sonia, but that threat was out of state. So they're kind of figuring that out right now. But because the Berkeley one was in state, they've worked with local authorities and she's been arrested. And that just goes to show like you can't be threatening people. You can't be threatening elected officials, their life. Like there are consequences. Well, there should be. I hope this, you know, uh, threatening somebody's life is a serious thing. Um, it is, it's a form of. It's a form of a scare tactic, a terrorist type of thing. Put fear in people's hearts. It, 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 they do this. Why? Because, yeah, they're, they're targeting her, but they're actually targeting all the other school mm -hmm. board members in the rest of the state who don't want to have to put up with death threats. And so they're send, this, these death threats are actually a warning to everybody else. Hey, this is what happens to somebody who stands up for kids. Well, and it's also so interesting that the people that are giving death threats to Sonia Shaw because she wants parents to be informed about what's going on in their children's lives, they're giving death threats, yet they claim to be the group of inclusion and acceptance. But apparently it's inclusion and acceptance only if you agree with them. The second you don't, they send death threats to your door? Well, you know, I mean... Uh... Obviously, we don't want to insinuate everybody on, who opposes us is willing to send death threats. I mean, we got some people on the you know ultra-right conservative side who've done the same thing to Senator Weiner, uh, which is equally as bad. And we have sent out two press releases when he's received death threats. So how about we just all stop threatening people, threatening yes. to kill people? We, we need to be able to debate these things, talk them through. Uh, obviously passions get involved and people get, you know, emotional because uh, they're emotional issues. But obviously we don't mm. want to be threatening anybody. No, basic humanity has gone out the door. Like you said, it's extreme on both ends. It doesn't matter what political party you align with, what you believe. 
no one should be threatened for their values or beliefs, and neither party should be threatening each other's lives. Absolutely. But that's... Oh, wait, we do have one last one thing to last talk about. One last thing. Um, we talked about this before, but, you know, we've been talking about a lot of parental rights. Well, we have an event coming up at State Capitol on August 21st. It, we are joining forces with Real Impact and uh, Capital Resource Institute with the California Family Council, and we are throwing a parental rights rally on the 21st on the west side steps of the Capitol and a lobby day. And so we are going to be training people how to lobby. We'll break you up into groups so you can go lobby your legislators in the office building, which is right next to the Capitol. And then we're having a rally um, with Pastor Jack Hibbs, uh, and a lot of other great speakers. Yeah, Sonia Shaw, who we've been talking about. She She'll will be, be there. So if you want to see her in person, uh, she will be uh, joining us. And so it should be a great event. And if we want to send a message to the legislators before they make their final votes on these bills, and there's a bunch of bills threatening parental rights, we need to show up in mass. Mm -hmm. And so I hope thousands and thousands of people will realize this is the time to say enough is enough. Uh, we got to make a, a stand and, and speak out on our parental rights or we will lose them. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I couldn't think of a better time to come up to the Capitol. The legislators are just coming back from their summer break. They're going to be making their final votes on some of these bills soon. Yep. You're going to have the opportunity to learn how to lobby from People such as Greg and Karen England with Capital Resource Institute have been spending years and years lobbying at the Capitol and know how to do it so well. You're going to have the opportunity to hear from some of the biggest key leaders and warriors in this fight for parental rights at the Capitol. You can tour the Capitol after the event. You get to hang out in Sacramento. There's tons of great coffee shops around here. Like, it's just going to be a great day. It's going to be a historical day if we can get thousands of people up here. Yeah. So. Book your flight, plan your drive, get your hotel, get up here and defend parental rights because, I mean, I've said it on here before, but we need to stop complaining about what's happening in the Capitol if we're not voting, if we're not making our voices heard and if we're not showing up. So show up. But if you can't show up, what's another way they can help with the event? Well, you can promote it to your friends and family. Uh, you can also go on our website and make phone calls. We have a campaign, uh, calling campaigns, uh, go to the top of the website and you'll see a little link there to click on our activism center. Uh, and you can make phone calls to your own legislators. Make sure they know that you are opposed uh, to a variety of bills that are threatening parental rights. Mm -hmm. So that's what you can do. And you can also donate. So California Family Council, we've talked about this before. We are a nonprofit organization. That's right. And we're here at the Capitol to be your voice, to be fighting in the Capitol daily, and to be keeping you aware of what's going on, as well as we have events and we host events like this Lobby Day and Lobby Days we've hosted in the past. And if you can't make it up here, we can always appreciate, or even if you can't make it up here, we always appreciate any donations to make right. these events possible and to continue doing the work we do up here. So if you're watching on the Facebook Live, there's a link to donate in the um, comments. If you are watching later on on a podcast, on our podcast or on our YouTube channel, you can visit CaliforniaFamily.org to get info and sign up for the event, to visit the call or the action center Greg talked about to make your calls, as well as if you scroll down on the main page, there's an opportunity to donate. And lastly, prayer. Pray for the event. Pray for safety of everyone here and pray that the hearts and minds of these legislators are changed when these parents show up. Absolutely. All right. Well, Sounds good. we will see you all next week.